Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Harnessing Innovation to Overcome Uncertainty, an exclusive Huawei Technology and Innovation Deep Dive, sponsored by Huawei. Before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. Under the slide view is the Q&A. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can type your question into the Q&A box and submit them to our speakers. All questions will be saved, so if we don't get to answer you, we may follow up via email. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow help widget. Here you can find answers to common questions. Towards the end of today's presentation, we'll ask you for your feedback. A survey is already open on your screen and will only take one minute to complete. Your feedback, your feedback is extremely helpful. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available about one day after the event and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier today. I would now like to turn the event over to our moderator, Ken Whelan. Thanks, Beth, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Over the next hour or so, we're going to be shining the spotlight on Huawei. It promises to be both fascinating and informative. We're going to be covering lots of ground, ranging from Huawei innovation through to digital transformation, sustainability, and the company's overall strategy. We'll also be exploring the company's vision for what it calls an intelligent world by 2030. But let's start off with some context. As we all know, these are unquestionably difficult times for Huawei. Geopolitical pressures and US-led sanctions have inevitably taken their toll. Huawei, in its full year 2021 financial results, posted a sharp year-on-year -year revenue decline. It was the first time in the company's financial reporting history which stretches back more than 20 years, that Huawei has posted a year-on-year -year drop in turnover. Yet, Huawei's 2021 results were noteworthy in other ways. Profits were up by more than 75%, and I'm sure we'll be delving into the drivers behind that. And Huawei's annual R&D budget reached an all-time high of $22.4 billion. US dollars. It's an enormous sum, and represents a huge 22% of sales. So what are Huawei's R&D priorities? We're going to find out during the webinar. But let's be clear, too, that all companies, not just Huawei, are having to deal with great political and economic uncertainty. Events in Ukraine impact nearly everyone. The pandemic threat is not going away, and, and inflation is on the rise. Before we begin, however, let me briefly explain how the webinar will be structured. To kick off, four senior Huawei executives will cover the company's financial performance and direction of innovation. On the four-way discussion panel are Glenn Schloss, who is VP of Public Affairs and Communications at Huawei USA, Paul Scanlon, who is CTO of Huawei's Carrier Network Business Unit, Mohamed Makur, who is VP of Global Wireless and Cloud Core Network Marketing and Solutions at Huawei, and Andy Purdy, who is Chief Security Officer at Huawei USA. This discussion should last about 45 minutes and there'll be a Q&A session afterwards. Please send your questions as the discussion unfolds and we'll pick them up in the Q&A. Following that, there'll be a 30 minute virtual fireside chat between Andy Purdy and John Arnold, who is principal of J. Arnold and Associates. John is an independent analyst and consultant and a specialist when it comes to assessing the business level impact of communications technologies on digital transformation. Among the topics Andy and John will discuss are technology megatrends and the importance of open R&D models to accelerate knowledge sharing. So let's get underway. Let's begin our discussion with Glenn, Paul, Mohammed, and Andy, which has the broad theme of how Huawei is harnessing innovation to respond to uncertainty. And don't forget to use the question facility on the webinar. So, Glenn, to you, I believe you're going to provide us with a business update on Huawei. Hey, thanks very much, Ken. Yeah, let's uh, zoom out and uh, take a broader look at uh, Huawei and uh, what the company um, is currently doing and its, its size and its growth. Um, if we go to the next slide, please.
I see. I'm controlling them here. Okay, apologies for that. So uh, in terms of Huawei's uh, status and where we are currently, it, it's more than 200,000 people. Uh, it's a global company in more than 170 countries. And of course, uh, our headquarters in is in China, which is uh, you know, a major part of the problem and challenges that we are facing, particularly with the US. Um, the proportion of our employees who are involved in, in R&D has grown from about 45% to 53% uh, in the past uh, few years as we've ramped up uh, investment into that area. Um, uh, according to uh, one indicator in, in, in the EU, uh, we're number three in R&D investment. And uh, there was a, a very interesting in-depth article in Bloomberg a few days ago, which uh, suggests that Huawei's proportion of investment is up there with uh, Alphabet or Google and uh, Microsoft, Amazon, and so on. Um, I believe that Amazon does lead overall, though. Um, so uh, the Huawei journey is more than 30 years old, um, and it has been one of uh, challenge and uh, resilience. Um, the company was founded by uh, Ren Zhengfei, uh, who was in the, in the uh, PLA in China, the, the Chinese military, and then uh, he um, was demobbed, or um, at the time, uh, many hundreds of thousands of uh, people in the PLA were um, uh, laid off, and he made his way into the private sector in Shenzhen. And after a few years, he got together with a group of uh, five people with a few thousand US dollars to found Huawei. Uh, so in 1987, they were importing equipment, uh, telecoms equipment, so primarily PABX equipment actually from Hong Kong and reselling it into the Chinese hinterland. And um, what happened was that the company, uh, you know, worked really hard in, in, in those Chinese rural areas uh, and then um, uh, selling to hotels, office, offices, uh, factories and so on. And um, then in the mid 90s, uh, managed to uh, develop its first digital switch um, because of the need uh, due to a supply chain issue. Um, and with that digital switch then, um, started to move into uh, Chinese cities. Of course, the, the company also uh, started to move out of China in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, because um, getting into those Chinese cities <laughs> were, was challenging because our competitors like uh, Ericsson and, and the other major Western um, network equipment manufacturers really had uh, Chinese cities uh, locked up. So we, we went offshore around 2000. And that was when the dot-com boom um, collapsed, you'll recall. And, um, but the company continued to invest. And uh, at that time, there was a huge shift of people from the Chinese hinterland uh, into cities. Uh, mobile networks were taking off. And the company uh, had good timing or, or got lucky, whatever you like. And you can see this massive expansion that incurred uh, from 2000 onward. Um, and the company continued to go offshore as well as grow its presence in China. Um, our, our smartphone business, which, uh, you know, uh, very proudly, we did become number one globally uh, just uh, two or three years ago. Um, uh, it was developed from about 2012 uh, onwards. So uh, in terms of the, the company's business strategy and focus, it, it has um, uh, its origins are with the network business. We're serving mobile and fixed network carriers. Um, and then, uh, as I said, expanded into um, devices. So we can think about the pipes of data that, that uh, you know, uh, that, that uh, keep people connected um, around the world and in, in countries and across nations and across borders. So that's the carrier business. And then the consumers are holding the devices which uh, provide, give them the data and give them access to the data. And of course, there's the enterprise business for the storage um, of the data. We're pretty much uh, hands off uh, generally when it comes to data and it's mobile uh, operators or fixed network, network uh, operators or enterprises that manage their data. We're really providing the pipes, the transmission, the storage and the display um, of that. Um, as a result of the sanctions uh, from the US government and the Trump administration uh, uh, two or three years ago, we've, we've now uh, built up here in the, in the bottom uh, layer, you can see our new intelligent automotive components. We don't want to be a car business, uh, auto business, but we are selling components for autonomous driving and connected cars and so on. Um, we're also ramping up our computing business. 
um, doing a lot of uh, fundamental basic research there as well as applied research. Um, and digital power is a new area for the company as well, or expanding our green offering, not only for network operators, but also for um, the transmission of power. Uh, here we can see the company's financial profile um, and the impact of the Trump administration sanctions is very evident uh, in 2021. And that was primarily a 30% reduction in revenue from um, the inability of our smartphone business to get access to um, the smallest uh, semiconductors, the five, seven nanometer semiconductors, and also the Google mobile mobile services. Um, so um, while the network and enterprise business remain pretty steady, you, you'll see that the uh, revenue for the first quarter is down and profit margin is also uh, down pretty heavily. Um, what's happening is that uh, the net profit at the end of uh, 2021 was uh, the growth there was primarily that can refer to the growth in net profit last year was primarily driven by our sales um, of two business units. One's the Honor smartphone unit, uh, which was a sub brand of Huawei and also the uh, enterprise uh, data server business that uh, required x86 chipsets, which we couldn't access any longer. So uh, ironically, that boost in net profit came from uh, uh, you know, unintended consequence of the sanctions. So uh, now we continue to invest in R&D, and you can see that's impacting the profit margin. So the company really is investing um, into R&D. And at, at the uh, analyst summit, uh, Ken Hu did um, highlight, our, our returning chairman did rotate, uh, highlight that innovation is in our DNA. So the R&D investment now is really uh, focusing on those areas that we can't access or, or develop because of the US uh, government sanctions. And they're looking primarily at fundamental theories, uh, software and architecture. Uh, here is a uh, intelligent world 2030 forecast that our uh, one of our leading scientists and researchers, Dr. Dr. Zhou Hong, uh, provided in his intelligent uh, world 2030 update, and um, uh, we're happy to provide more details later and the various hypotheses he set out uh, about the intelligent world over the next seven eight years. But uh, his bottom line is that. Uh, digital technology is going to develop at a, at a rate of over a hundredfold per decade. Um, so digitalization uh, and um, and information is really uh, intelligence is, is really going to be the driving um, force um, for uh, for society as well as Huawei. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Um, j just a quick question from me. Obviously, Huawei's enjoyed remarkable growth over the years, revenue wise and profit wise. But obviously, 2021 wasn't the case. Revenues are down and profit margins shrank. So I just want to ask you quickly, are your high levels of R&D sustainable? Uh, yeah, increasingly, because um, we, we need that uh, to deal with the current situation and to pro uh, to find alternatives um, and solutions for technology that we cannot access, um, but also in, in order to invest into the future. Um, a, a good example of the way in which basic research can uh, is, is that is essential that we're focusing on increasingly basic research is, is the, um, the 5G um, leadership that the company has had. And that came through a, a breakthrough in, um, uh, in algorithms that we can discuss a, a bit later, but that was a study of, uh, we were studying and looking closely at, at what academics were doing with algorithms and, and Shannon's law. And we managed to uh, get, get that breakthrough from uh, basic research. Okay, thanks a lot, Glenn. Paul, you know, as, as CTO of Huawei's carrier network business unit, is levels of R&D investment an issue? From what Glenn's saying, it's not. So thanks, Ken. No, I don't believe it is uh, an issue at all. And the reason, is, mm. as you've heard from Glenn, it's the foundation, or what, what Ken Hu said, it's the foundation of Huawei, OK? Since um, <clears throat> since the PABX product was not made available to Huawei back in the mid-90s, that's when the company understood the value of uh, IPR and uh, the reason for investing in, in research and development. So today we have research centres across the world and a lot of the development is still done in China, but uh, research is done on a collaborative basis globally. 
guidance. So it's not just done uh, by Huawei or in Huawei offices, etc. So different countries specialize in different types of uh, research based on their, I'll say, their own DNA, you know, their own capability. So we have, you know, optics done in one place. We have um, software done in another place for algorithms, as uh, as Glenn mentioned. We have software for managed services in other in other places, and um, you know, radio and antennas in def different countries. Yeah, but perhaps uh, Ken, if I just explain why the heavy investment in R and D to amplify what Glenn has mentioned, you know, if, if you're if certain components of your core business are affected because of supply chain issues, then obviously you're going to take a much harder look at your business. But um, you know, you'd be very naive to think that Huawei only started thinking about business continuity management after Mr. Trump. Yeah, that that's not the case at all, right? We were taught BCM many years ago by our customers and our partners, so we, we sort of understood that many many years ago. And Huawei, certainly for as long as I can remember, even back in our original 2012 labs, which is the bleeding edge of, of research, we were studying, you know, graphene and beyond silicon and uh, beyond lithium, for example, yes? A lot of these sorts of uh, the th things were, were being investigated. And, you know, six or seven years ago, we decided to double our investment in 5G because we could see the benefits that 5G would have the profound benefits that 5G would have in industry, and that's obviously paid off, as um, as, as Glenn just mentioned. But um, there was a particularly interesting slide there that Glenn had, which showed the different business units. Yes, sir. and that showed how Huawei has diversified its um, its products. You know, about uh, eight or nine years ago, we created actually we created the enterprise business. So we had a, a carrier business, the business that sells products to telecom operators, one industry sector. And we realized pretty quickly that if you want to move into the enterprise space where the margins are a lot bigger and, and certainly the market space is a lot broader, um, we recognized that a lot of the core components that were in the carrier business, you know, hubs, routers, switches, well, they're the same in all enterprises, right? Identical. In fact, they're not really identical because in the carrier business, there are they're a lot better, you know, the reliability is a lot better and they're a lot more secure because of the critical nature of telecom infrastructure and the amount of money that's spent globally in telecom business. So we already recognized that many years ago and we, so we folded the R&D and started doing common things across different business units. And this slide, the one that uh, Glenn was showing, the, um, uh, you know, this particular slide here, that shows the different type of business units. You know, we developed devices and the strategy in devices was really to leverage the capability we had developed in our, at the time, four and 3G base stations in terms of power management and chip design. So we already started building this business unit and in enterprise business, we had already started to use common components in our R&D. So, if you move forward now, then, you know, this connectivity business and devices business is still sitting there. But as Glenn mentioned, we have a number of other business units. And in about 2008 or 2000, so about 2009, 2010, we started to embark on using cloud-based architecture for ourselves. So we were investigating how the benefits of cloud would improve different sectors of Huawei's business internally. And then we started the road to develop those that capability, both technically and commercially, and in a sales fashion, to take it to market. And that's why we have the distinct business of, of cloud. Um, around the same time, we had been investigating high throughput computing and different type of architectures of both uh, uh, software and also different type of chips and also different architectures beyond x86 and you know, risk processes etc and that was around the time when we started to ramp up high silicon in terms of um, chip design it was also about the time we were investing significant amounts in optical research and how we could apply optics beyond fiber and some of those things have now spilt over into two other business units like 
intelligent automotive components and also into digital power. So digital power is very straightforward. It, it's not, there's no security issue with digital power, right? It's uh, quite, quite um, benign, if you like. But as you can see from here, we know smart photovoltaic cells. I say smart because we interface the photovoltaic cells to an AI-based solution that allows it to monitor how much energy is being produced, look at the demand for energy and the cap capacity of the batteries, for example, and then do some prediction about how much is going to be required, how much should be stored, how much can be consumed, et cetera. So we've applied AI across multiple business units. We've applied it to ourselves and we're enhancing, I'll say some fairly basic technologies from rectifiers and batteries and solar cells. Yes, and that comes directly from understanding that in our core business, which is the connectivity business, one of the biggest cost components is electricity. And if you look at what's been going on the last couple of years, everybody's talking about either the pandemic security or they're talking about um, saving the planet, right? So every watt we can save is obviously a watt better for our, um, for our children. So this concept we have taken from base stations to smartphones, I think it's fair to say that most users of Huawei's devices recognize superior battery performance of our products, right? All of these, these things, yes, smartphones. So we've taken that capability into a very specific business unit now, which we call digital power. Yes. And okay. the largest photovoltaic cells in the world are manufactured by Huawei, you know, the largest power plants, you know, the two gigawatt ones, and, and there are larger ones about to be built in Saudi. And if you move into auto autonomous vehicles, again, it's looking at, as you said, Glenn, you know, 30% um, is gone, our revenue from devices, yes. But the car market is, you could almost argue about the same size, yes, in terms of opportunity. So Huawei doesn't have an interest in manufacturing vehicles per se. But if you think about it, vehicle manufacturers are very good at chassis, engines, drivetrains, wheels, etc. But the car of the future, which is really the car now, has batteries, power management software, together with rectifiers and you know servers and storage, you know memory and things like that, and 5G and IoT. And well, Huawei makes all of that together with a Harmony operating system and heads-up displays with artificial intelligence that can recognise through the heads-up display whether it's a person about to cross the road, et cetera, and start anticipating and predicting these things. So we've taken our capability from across a number of different businesses and we've looked at the R&D components and we've been able to put those into new business streams. Yes? And the underlying components of that really is taking a hard look at our R&D. And the reason I say we take a hard look because one of the things you know, just mentioned about our, our, our profit, but well, one of the things that come, when you're denied supply of anything, the first thing you start to do is have a look at the profitability of every single product and every single business, right? That, that's normal. And you obviously stop selling or, or re reduce the amount of, I'll say, less profitable products. And obviously the percentage of the other products as a, as a proportion of the whole lot increases, obviously you're, you're your percentage of profit improves. And the other thing, by doing that, you also start to focus core R&D and become more efficient in software development and, and how you apply certain types of technologies across different product lines. And then you take that to market. So that's that's where we are at the moment in this phase. You heard both Ken Hu now and you heard Guo Ping before talking about the challenges we have, and that's not that's not going to go away. But as Glenn mentioned, the reason we're focusing on and why we're confident that we can continue to focus on, on R&D is, you know, that cash cow is the connectivity business and to some extent the enterprise business. And we use that and that's why you see differences in first quarter this year because we're applying more money to R&D as we see the new business opportunities where we can leverage that capability and take different types of products to market. So that, that's why I think the company is still in a very healthy state, despite seeing a drop in revenue, or even the first okay. results. Yeah. They're not, 
not really anything here. Sorry, I'll carry on. Yeah, hand over no, to no, you. No, that's fine. I mean, you mentioned Huawei's BCM and measures that Huawei's taken to sort of compensate for these US-led sanctions. But can I just ask you, I mean, because you've got no easy access to advanced components and semiconductors, the traditional sort of supply chain, has that acted mm. a break on the pace of Huawei's innovation in the short and medium term? Um, it, it must have affected, no, had no, some impact. No, okay. Well, it has had impact. It's had, uh, well, the impact it's had, Ken, you can see the impact directly in the devices business, yes? I mean, oh. may, you know, differentiators in here, seven nanometers, five nanometers, yes, certainly it's quite um, quite straightforward. But in a 10 or 20 kilogram 5G base station or a two and a half ton car electric vehicle, it's not really significant, yes? Whether I use two 24 millimeter chips or whether I, a nanometer chips or whether I use one seven as an example, yes? And the second part is what is often done in hardware, not often, but a lot of components can be done in software, yes? And maybe you might okay. need a couple of other chips instead of one chip to be able to get around it. Maybe you could have used less lines of code, but this is what Huawei has been doing as part of our transformation. So it's not as though it, it's hampered our business directly. Yes, because you can't take an off the shelf product and put it in and, and integrate it. But what it's done is it's made us reconsider how we can take the tools we have. And as Mr. Ren says, take third, you know, third tier products and tools and make first class products, right? So you take, you know, third class chips or bits and pieces and put them together in a clever way to make world class products. And that you can see by market share that we've taken in from digital power and cloud, et cetera, in our connectivity business, as well as in intelligent, um, the automotive components. Okay, Paul, thanks very much for that sort of um, really informative uh, look at R&D from Huawei. Now I'm going to turn to Mohammed, and uh, I believe you, Mohammed, you're going to talk about technology innovation oh. with special attention to 5G, 5.5G and fixed broadband. Mohammed. Hi, thanks, Ken, and um, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, yes, certainly. Um, that's... Uh, a very good area actually to talk about. Uh, but uh, I always, before uh, talking about any innovations uh, from Huawei, um, I like to mention some numbers, uh, not like as insights, but I think uh, one of the things that uh, we've, been, uh, we've been moving so fast or in a very fast pace is that if you look back in the last two years, you will see that you know, uh, while the whole world was slowing down, uh, ICT industry actually was running fast. Uh, it's actually running faster and faster. And uh, I think Huawei, we were matching that pace in terms of innovations. And to be honest with you, you know, when I look back uh, like 2019 and 2018, I've been in Huawei for so many years, and to see the amount uh, of innovations and also the uh, how influential that uh, innovation um, in all business aspects, I see that it's going up and up. Like last Mobile World Congress uh, two months ago or so, uh, we've released so many different innovations in different aspects um, of uh, like carrier networks or uh, digital power or so on and so forth, like what was talked about. So uh, some of the numbers, I'm not going to dig into all of those numbers, but you see that for 5G, for example, there are more than 200 networks, 700 million 5G users, uh, not just about consumer business. You see that we have more than 3,000 5G to be uh, commercial contracts and about I think 700 of those are already uh, deployed they are commercial uh, they are uh, in action uh, smart home from different angle is getting very popular uh, many carriers are deploying uh, deploying AI now so connectivity AI are, are important so imagine if we look now let's fast forward to the future 10 years from today 
I mean, those numbers that you see in front of you, and there are other numbers. I mean, there is no, uh, I didn't mean specific meaning to mention some of those numbers, but uh, you will see that these numbers actually are so little if you look for, if you push or fast forward to the future. So because we actually know that, so let me switch to the next slide. So we, what we introduced new this year is what we call a guide model. And, um, and actually, uh, this model is very important even, I mean, it's not a secret, but even when Huawei talks to executives from our customers, no matter who they are, like governments or carriers or uh, anyone, we follow that model and uh, we got a lot of buy-in uh, from the industry uh, from that model. And so basically, uh, if you look at the top level of that model, you will see the business capability. So if we ask ourselves, what are the three top things that any enterprise is, is, is looking for? Uh, number one, service expansion. I need to expand my service. Number two, I need to enhance the efficiency. Number three, I need to leverage all of the resources. And hopefully when I um, uh, adopt those three or I improve those three aspects, I will gain two things. The first one is commercial competitiveness. And the last one is the social value, which is very important because I'm going to be helping the environment or our kids and grandkids, like Paul mentioned. So that's the last portion. So that's the top part. So let's think now technology. We're talking about technology innovation. So what is it that we need to, to satisfy those uh, uh, capabilities or those values or uh, those targets? The first one, we need gigabit everywhere. That's, there is no secret about that. The whole talk in the whole industry about gigabit. Uh, it's, the, it's an initiative. It's a reality. Even we started to see some homes in developed countries uh, like uh, China and the United States and others. They have gigabit per second. We've started to see uh, some countries uh, they having spots in mobile service gigabit per second. So anyway, gigabit is needed for so different reasons. Um, now, the second goal, which is the ultra automation, actually, ultra automation now is not an option. So the question is, uh, basically, how fast you will develop the automation uh, scheme and, and, uh, and the level of automation, the depth of automation in your enterprise. Uh, number three is the intelligent multi-cloud. Now, the network and cloud are not really separate and silo. They are integrated together. And uh, every business is looking, or every enterprise is looking to cloudify its uh, service. So intelligent multi-cloud and network as a service is a key direction. Uh, number four is differentiated experience. And when we talk about the experience, we're not talking about speed, we're talking about latency reliability. Last but not least to me is the most important one is ESG, which is environmental uh, social and governance, and basically decarbonization. Now, if we look at those five, actually, it happened that the first letter of each of those words, they do spell the word, the word guide. And that's what we mean about guide model. Now, I just came from a business trip from uh, Latin America, and I talked to uh, CEOs of a couple of carriers there, and, and they basically mentioned that that's really cool, but we need to see where we are, we stand today and what is the benchmark. And then I showed them some of the benchmark of each one of those five. For example, now in Gigabit, we're looking at certain hotspots in the capital. Maybe the next couple of years, we're looking to cover the whole capital of major cities. Maybe later, it's going to be ubiquitous, average Gigabit per second. So this kind of thing is not something to happen to tomorrow or next year. It's going to happen, I think, uh, over the next, um, I would say, 10 years or five years. It's dependent. Looking at the environmental and social and, and green aspects, yeah, last year we put together an index. We called it Network Carbon Intensity, and uh, which is basically the carbon divided by bits, which we want it to be less. 
So if you benchmark the network to, to, to see now we're at, for example, 100, the, the index is 100, maybe we need to get less and less. So I'm not going to get into details in any of each one of those, but I think what I wanted to say is when Huawei, when we talk about innovation, we talk about innovation that really boosts the certain strategy for all customer and customer value, commercial and social, and that's what um, I think uh, influence uh, all of our innovation. So uh, today, in the next couple of minutes, I will just go over the word G and tell you what is the innovation about G, which is the gigabit aspect. So if you look at these two hexagon in front of you, the left one, we call it the 5.5G, uh, uh, I would say, category of use cases. And the right one, we call it the next generation 5.5G of fixed broadband. So what is the stories of these two? There are a lot of acronyms, but uh, let's, let's talk high level. So uh, about two years ago, we basically uh, guided the industry that 5G need to grow and we need to look beyond 5G to 5.5G. So at that time, the industry knows that famous triangle, which is enhanced mobile broadband, ultra reliable low latency, and also ENTC, which is connectivity. So we, uh, because we see the need from enterprises and from industries, verticals, we see that uh, we need to grow that. So we uh, proposed to, in, to, to, to switch or to uh, grow that triangle to hexagon. So we added the uh, ultra reliable uh, uh, like uplink uh, con uh, you know, uh, communication, the, uh, the, uh, harmonized, uh, the, the harmonized communication and sensing, and not just for communication, also for sensing. So we added some, uh, some of these aspects. And over the last two years, we've been improved. A lot of technologies, they have been, uh, they, they actually mature. Uh, of course, uh, 3GPP endorsed our, uh, our work and they released 5G Advanced. So that's from the mobile part. Now, how about the fixed part, the right-hand side? It's see also a couple of years ago, they put together the word F5G, which is basically the next generation fixed uh, broadband. Uh, basically, uh, full fiber uh, everywhere, full fiber connectivity, faster speed up to one gigabit per second, and also uh, guaranteed uh, reliable experience. That's the triangle. Actually, last week, or basically two days ago uh, in uh, Shenzhen, we released almost the same vision as we did two years ago in wireless. We released it for fiber. We released the F 5.5G. So, which is basically added those three categories of things that the industry need to work on. It's not just about Huawei's innovation. Actually, we set the industry vision, and then we innovate to satisfy this vision and getting the whole ecosystem together. So, basically, we work on um, uh, on the energy efficiency. We work on to 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 to, uh, to grow the telecom grade to industrial grade of fiber, extending fiber everywhere to the machine to the office so on and so forth. So that's some uh, summary of just a couple of areas under one of the aspects that we see needed in the future, which is the G. All, a, lot of th a lot of other innovation, of course, the time is not enough to mention those things, but just a, just a sneak peek of what we have. Back to you, Ken. Thanks, Andy. That was very good. I was going to ask you a follow-up question. About Mohammed. Think... Oh, Mohammed. Mohammed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you a follow-up question, but I think mm -hmm. time might be against us a little bit. So I'm going to move uh, swiftly on to uh, mm -hmm. Andy, who is... Uh... Andy, hello. Hi. Yeah. Now, as the Chief Security Officer at Huawei USA, uh, what sort of cybersecurity role is Huawei playing in, in the U.S.? And given that U.S. authorities are highly suspicious of Huawei, believing you're a threat to national security, isn't that role greatly diminished? Well, we look at our role in cybersecurity and privacy protection uh, as fundamental to our company because for us to be able to continue to do business in 170 countries, for us to be trusted by 700 cities, for us to be trusted by 267 of the global 500 companies for their digital transformation, we have to be trusted and there has to be an objective and transparent basis for that trust. So 
we continue to, to message within the United States and collaborate globally to promote a safer, more accountable cyberspace with greater privacy protection. And so part of our role is to be a champion. Part of the reason I joined Huawei was to promote a safer cyberspace. So we continue to believe it's fundamentally important to have a, a strong international co co cooperation and collaboration for a more comprehensive framework that can assure end users that each element of the network has been examined for the ability to support their safe and secure access. And so there need to be aligned responsibilities, unified standards, and clear accountability. There needs to be further development of zero trust concepts. So for us, our level of effort is huge. Regarding network security and product security, what we're doing internally, of course, is we are maintaining our global assurance program, working very closely with our partners and customers around the world, understanding their regulatory requirements, disclosure requirements. We have our internal testing of products before they leave Huawei, using the best tools in the world that we purchase. Uh, we also have our uh, external testing and evaluation centers where, such as in Brussels, we have a transparency center. Uh, companies, individuals, experts can come into Huawei and they can test our products. We are huge believers in transparency. A couple of years ago, I asked the now Deputy National Security Advisor, Ann Newberger, to come into Huawei if they would be open to having NSA come into Huawei facilities to look at what we do and how we do it. We are open to that kind of uh, discussion. We're also involved in the international responsible vulnerability disclosure sharing as we work with certs around the world. But a key point I wanna make building on uh, what's been said is that those security efforts are, are, are fundamental and we need greater audit and conformance, greater testing programs for cybersecurity and privacy for everybody so we can find bad things before there's a major data breach, before there's a major cyber attack. But beyond network security, as we move into the digitalization, uh, we move into the 5G enabled technologies. It's also important that, that governments and private companies work collaboratively like we are continuing to do with our partners and customers to make sure that, that there is a basis for trust, that there are security requirements, there's conformance, there's independent testing of our products. We comply with the standards, we help inform additional standards, and that's what's necessary to help make a safer cyberspace. And we hope the United States government and uh, major companies and experts can participate more in the global standards efforts, the standards around NISIS, the Network Equipment Security Assurance Scheme, and to work more with us and others to help make sure there's greater security in these digital, di digitalized sectors and, uh, and enterprises. Okay, thanks, thanks, Andy, for that. I mean, just, um, I can see you sort of um, want collaboration and work closely with others, uh, standards bodies, and so on. Can you just tell me the level of engagement Huawei has with, with, with operators and businesses in the US? Is, is it difficult to get a foot in the door to, to explain your messages? Yeah, we, we have difficulty having conversations uh, because of the toxic political environment. Uh, of course, in terms of the, the kinds of goals that Huawei has, as, as you know from the earlier conversation, the ability of, of American companies to sell non-sensitive technology to Huawei is, is fundamentally important. Uh, and even the toxic political environment makes it difficult to even have those conversations. And, and those changes are probably gonna depend on the, what's in the best interest of the United States, what those companies need in terms of the ability to sell to Huawei uh, and others. So uh, we are quite hamstrung in our ability to have those kinds of conversations, but we have conversations around the world that's going to help create the ability of, of those who want to do business with us to be able to say to the United States, no, we have these mechanisms in place. We have these conformance programs. We have these independent testing. And while the United States is trying to raise defenses for our government agencies and, and, and critical infrastructure, this international collaboration is going to help promote a safer cyberspace. And someday in the United States, when the United States has much greater requirements for cybersecurity and uh, uh, privacy, uh, where, uh, regardless of what country the products are made in, that there's gonna be much greater standards because it's been proven that trusted suppliers has no meaning anymore. And we have to test critical components from everyone. Someday in the future, Huawei will be able to participate in the uh, the competition for business at that point. Okay, th th thanks very much, Andy. Um, just a reminder to everybody on the webinar to send in some questions. Uh, you can send them in now. We're gonna have a Q and A session uh, very shortly. But maybe just before we do that, I'll just open it up to to, to Paul, Mohammed, and Glenn as well. Um, something that Huawei is putting forward a, a lot is this vision, 
intelligent world by 2030. Um, Paul, is it possible to elaborate on that? And what is the vision exactly? And what innovation is needed to deliver it? You know, if we, if we wanted to um, save a billion lives, right, in healthcare, mm -hmm. yeah, just as an example, yes, you need to set a target, right? So you need to have a target. You need to have a vision of some form, yes? And the same thing if you want to, you know, bottom line, we want to save the planet, right? And, and then you try and make a whole bunch of strategies and tactics below that. But you must have a vision. So the reason Huawei sets these is not just as pie in the sky or something that's very waffly that may may be what it seems to a lot of western people but somebody's worked you know people like Mohammed myself who worked in the company for for uh, you know 15 years or so we see things very differently it's a way of uh, it's almost a, like a, a rallying call right to bring everybody together it's a bit like what Ken who is saying you know the, the vision of 10g to everybody okay because what we're trying to demonstrate is based on what Huawei has seen in industry, in our development, we can foresee what's happening. And therefore, we are predicting what needs to be put in place to achieve that, okay? That's what we're doing. So examples of, uh, you know, one gig, 10 gig, etc. Just, just take examples, let's take the Middle East, okay? And arguably, uh, put China aside, but arguably, if you took Middle Eastern countries, the 5G speed there and the fiber speed there is faster than anywhere else in the world. Pick any region you like, right? Pick the sum of all Western Europe, yes? Pick all of North America or anywhere else you like, just as an example, okay? And what's happened in those places is, first of all, they, the governments there, in order to achieve economic growth, see that industries need to be transformed, see that things need to be done in a different, different way. So these countries understand that. You know, when we talk about fibre to the room, which I don't think, Mohammed you, you mentioned, but why would you want fibre to the room? You know, surely it's cost, you know, it's expensive. We could have done fibre 20 years ago, but it costs a fortune, right? We didn't really have the technology at the right pricing point. But we can see what's happened with very specifically user-generated video content, whether it's in security, whether it's in, in high-definition video for uh, healthcare, or whether it's in remote and or urban-based learning, you know, whether it's high schools or universities, we can see these trends, okay? So we know what where we need to apply the R&D, yes? And I think it's that's the reason why Huawei sets these types of targets. When we were talking about um, innovation, <coughs> You know, some simple, I'll call them simple innovation, but they're, they're rather com complex in how they were achieved. But an antenna, you know, an antenna sits on every single piece of base station, right? If an antenna is more efficient by 20%, you save 150 watts per base station per hour, okay? So put that in context. US has got what, uh, maybe Andy, you can correct me, 300 plus 1,000 sites. So it must have about a million antennas. Million antennas at 150, that's 150 million watts, right? So it's 150 megawatts. That's a power station, Ken, right? So if you want, trying to put things in perspective, if we want to achieve certain outcomes, then we need to have the right sort of vision. And that's why Huawei puts these vision statements forward based on evidence that we have, whether it's in industry, you know, saving lives. How do you save lives? Well, you put 5G in the hospitals and you connect it up so you can pull all the data, connect it up to an artificial intelligence engine, and doctors can have answers to all sorts of tests instantly. And I mean instantly, right? That's what you get. But how do we then promote that, right? Do we say 5G in all hospitals? Example, yes. Artificial intelligence in all hospitals. You know, what's the type of rallying cry to bring all this, to bring everything together. And that's, okay, it's a marketing message, yes. But it allows everybody to try and focus around the problem, yeah? You wanna fix the world in, in the pand pandemic for the, vac for the virus? You need everybody to agree to stop the geopolitics on the, on the vaccines, you know? Last time I looked, I couldn't tell the difference whether it was made in Germany, America, or China. 
certainly not for yellow fever, typhoid, or any of the other vaccines that I've had over the last 70 years. You get my meaning? Anyhow. Back to thank you, you Paul. And um, that brings us to the end of our discussion. So I want to thank not only Paul, but Glenn, um, Andy, and Mohammed. Uh, that was fantastic. Thanks very much uh, for, for that. Uh, now we're going to move on to the um, Q&A. And I see some questions are coming through, which is great, but we, we perhaps could do some more. Um, one question here, perhaps this is uh, for you, Andy. Um, do you expect any change from the Biden administration? Well, when I assume you're asking uh, in terms of Huawei, I, I certainly don't expect uh, any, any change in the immediate future. Um, I, I have been heartened by uh, the Biden administration emphasis on uh, the importance of a rules-based order uh, in the international community. And that's quite consistent with what, what we think is necessary in the international community. Uh, we do hope that the Biden administration will be open to having some conversations, not so much about, you know, specific things that we need, but talking about the kinds of things that we've been talking about today, about, about what's necessary uh, in the future for these technologies to bring their full advantages to people and organizations. And to see, this is what we're working toward. The U.S. doesn't have to work with us, but the U.S. really needs to know, you know, where does the world have to go? What, what are the capabilities that are necessary? And frankly, there ought to be some openness uh, as Huawei participates in peer-reviewed articles and, and some of these hardcore research. Uh, researchers in America, in, in academia or private companies or the government, they ought to include us in conversations about what's necessary and how progress is driven, because the progress is going to benefit the world. It's, it's not going to benefit Huawei in, in, a, in, a gigantic, uh, uh, in a gigantic way. So, so we hope there will be that openness, and we frankly hope the U.S. will participate much more strongly in 5G standards. We hope the Biden administration will do that, because the U.S. government, as well as our private companies, our academic experts, really need to participate in those standards efforts to help understand the threat better, understand what controls need to be put in place, what controls are worthy of the level of a standard. And hopefully the U.S. government will help empower and provide some funding for American companies and American experts to participate in those 5G standards efforts. So in those respects, I hope there can be some progress. Glenn, I wonder if I could just ask the same question to you uh, in terms of the Biden administration. Is there, is there cause for more optimism from the Hawaii perspective than, than the Trump administration? Yeah, yeah, look, a uh, um, general assessment is that the Biden administration is certainly much more rational and considered um, in terms of the actions or uh, current position regarding Huawei than, say, the Trump administration was, where there were um, orders and directives being put in place um, on a very ad hoc and, um, you know, sometimes fast-moving basis. Um, in, in terms of the drivers or the... Uh, the reasons why the Biden administration may uh, engage or be interested to, to talk with Huawei. Uh, we believe uh, if there are uh, American companies or, or uh, vendors or customers, right, the vendors, the, the, the big, big tech um, or customers in the U.S. have a need for Huawei technology or want to um, gather, gain sales or um, revenue by uh, partnering with Huawei. We had been spending up to about 18 billion U.S. dollars a year on our supply chain from the U.S., um, look, um, the other areas may be in, in some of uh, the R&D we're looking at and, and there may be interest from in industry or academia. Um, Ken, you were just asking about the areas of focus for the R&D program or the Intelligent World 2030. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. It, it's, you know, the, the, the team globally is looking at and monitoring um, and they really, they really believe that there has been an absence of breakthrough in key technologies for some decades. And, uh, you know, there's these, uh, the, the Nyquist uh, sampling theorem, Shannon's, uh, Shannon's limit, um, uh, Moore's law when it comes to uh, semiconductors, the von Neumann architecture in computing that. Now, imagine if you're an engineer and these were your KPIs to, to break these or find some limit, but the team is, the team is doing that. Um, and focusing on these areas. And they do need that collaboration. We do need that global um, collaboration, that collaboration with the US and, and the whole technology industry needs that as well. 
Uh, I'm not sure if Andy has anything to add about um, the, you know, uh, the, you know, the Biden administration's initial view uh, about Huawei being a uh, not not a trusted vendor. Yeah, let me let me just add that I I think you know Glenn makes some some great points. I think one of the other huge areas that Huawei is involved in that hopefully they'll be willing to talk with with Huawei about is is the whole effort uh, working within the information communication technology technology industry to try to move to achieve the 2030 carbon neutral goals uh, of the industry and the technologies they support. I think Huawei is doing just incredible things on on creation, transmission, and storage of a of electric power. I would add one other issue that I hope we'll have a chance to talk with the Biden administration. Information we just learned in a public statement by a former Commerce Department official uh, earlier this month that there is a criteria in the Commerce Department that has a definition of what it, how a company is considered to be affiliated with the Chinese government. We never heard of such a criteria before. And essentially, it's a presumption that every Chinese company is affiliated unless the company proves otherwise. And we would love the opportunity uh, to prove uh, that we are independent from the China government and that our products and our services uh, should be trusted. OK, thanks, Andy. Thanks, Glenn. Um, another question is coming through. I think this one is for Paul, really. Um, how do you see the relationship between innovation and future revenue? In the past, this was broken. Is the link clearer now? Yeah, hi, Chris. It's Paul here. Good to hear from you after so long. Um, okay, is it broken or was it broken in the past? Is it clearer? So I can recall the time when uh, you know, everybody gets their end of year bonuses, right? And uh, well, Mr. Wren, our founder, he decided to give some of the R&D guys a different type of bonus. He gave them as a bonus that uh, product that they invented that nobody bought. Yeah, this is quite some time back, about uh, 20 years ago. So when we do innovation now in Huawei, and what we have been doing for quite some time, is we link customer requirements directly with R&D innovation. Okay, so the R&D innovation is not innovation for the sake of dreaming up something that you can't take to market. Okay, you've said here very specific, specifically the relationship between innovation and future revenue. So if you just look at some of the key components there that um, that uh, that Glenn was mentioning about Shannon's law, Nyquist, et cetera, yeah? and one of them is a very simple one, and it's relating just to antenna sizing and dipoles, yes, and quarter wavelengths, et cetera. Well, you know, we've already found a way to get around that. Yes, now you might say, well, what's the application? Well, the application is very simple. If you can put all the antennas in one, just giving you a simple example, and this is correct, then um, instead of having, you know, 24 antennas sitting on a mast, you have one, you know, because you can pack everything into one. So the benefits downstream are that this provides a huge amount of efficiency. Yes, lighter loading, less requirement to go and install, maintain the cost, the logistics, all of those things they have a huge, a huge cost bringing all those things. So the point I'm trying to make is that where Huawei is innovating has always been innovating in what we call fundamental areas. We also innovate jointly with our customers. Yes. And the target is always to provide, always to provide a benefit to the customer. Okay, that's the most important. So if you can work closely with customers, your innovation is very clearly linked to your customer's business success. That's always been the case for Huawei, right? Um, and I think, you know, you had uh, uh, another component there about, you know, how do we continue to play in 5G networks in Europe from David Martin? Yes. And in this particular case, it's not every country that's banning Huawei, okay? It's not every country that's banning Huawei. And even those countries that are banning Huawei to some extent, there is a significant period of time where the equipment will... So there's still a significant amount of business that's being done. And the hardware that we're using for 5G is applicable to 4G. So in a lot of places, you know, you can aggregate carriers in 4G and you can get a lot of mileage out of doing some very clever things in, in 4G using 5G based technologies, just as you can apply the same 5G technologies to Wi-Fi 6. 
as an example. So there are many areas that we continue to play in this thing called 5G, in, even in Europe. Yeah, well, that's that brings us Just nicely on to... Um, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Paul. That brings us nicely on to uh, another question, uh, which is asking, in the light of all the bands on Huawei in Western markets, how, how, how do all the speakers think Huawei can best continue to play in the European 5G marketplace? Um, are the doors closed in many markets or, or do you still see opportunities? I'm not sure who to, best to ask that. Um, oh, well, I, 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 gave, I gave some comment. Just, I gave some comment just now, I can. But you know, it's not. I say it's not every market that is close to Huawei. Um, and I'm not going to pick on any no, particular country that, and, no. and answer all those questions because that's not that's not that's not really important because the question is broader than that. But even in those countries that are, I'll say, sitting on the fence or considering, there's significant scope to play in the 5G area. Okay. There's an awful lot of business opportunities, and we, you know, the market share that um, perhaps some of the, um, what do you call them, the, the, uh, the, uh, the insight companies we've forgotten now, the consultants are, are claiming that you know we've lost market share here or there or somewhere else. It depends how you claim market share by revenue, by number of sites or base stations, etc. So. That's not the most important component. What's the most important is that Huawei continues to support our customers. So those customers that choose to continue to business with Huawei, then we will improve their business. You know, that's that's what's called win-win, right? And if it's not specifically in a 5G base station, it might be in a core network, it might be in a fiber area, it might be cloud area, it might be autonomous vehicles, it might be in digital power solutions and a few other areas that we're experimenting with. So, no, I don't believe the doors are closed in Europe at all. Okay, thanks, Paul. We're getting lots of um, re um, requests if um, slides can be sent out from, from, from the presenters. Uh, that, that will not happen, but you can sort of watch. Um, you, Light Reading will send an on-demand link to, to you, and you can watch the session video again. I, I think it's within 24 hours, so you will still be able to see the slides but they won't be shared um, with you um, I hope that clarifies that um, let's an, another question now is coming in from uh, Chris again who pays for the 10 gigabit when will consumers need 10g who pays for it mm. and when will consumers need it yeah I can take that um, question yeah okay yeah, so basically that's a very legitimate uh, question. Now, you know, we're, we're, we set the vision for different innovations and we support it, but there are two questions. Uh, where the demand is, that's number one, and where, where the supply is. Like, where is the supply and where is the demand? The supply is basically our role as vendors to innovate and to produce the systems, the uh, uh, theory, the software, the hardware, the architecture to support that innovation. But basically, if we do that without demand, that doesn't mean anything. So for 10 gigabit per second, basically, we're, of course, even for the consumer, we're talking about uh, some applications, the uh, Hologramic, for example, remote communication. We're talking about uh, uh, all of those kind of AR, of, of maybe simultaneous connectivity and multiple connectivity. But basically, if you look broader than that, uh, look broader than consumer business. So basically, you have uh, consumer segments, you have enterprise segment, you have vertical segments. Uh, those are very different. And if we talk about industry and verticals, you're talking, for example, about uh, robotics. Robotics, they do need 10 gigabit per second, especially in the uplink. And they also do need low latency. So we just need to broad, broadly look at the market, the opportunity. And I think enterprise market is growing fast. There's a huge opportunity there for carriers. And that what needed 
Uh, we need gigabit per second for every room. We need to connect even every machine in the industry. And when I talk about gigabit per second, 10 gigabit per second, it's both from fixed and mobile. I mean, there are complementary and they serve a lot of places. But to me, the 10 gigabit per second or those technology, they serve the better or bigger uh, demand, which is the demand for decarbonization. Uh, that's huge. If you use more efficient technology, you will use or you will emit less carbon. So that's basically uh, what we need to be after, commercial competitiveness and also social value and decarbonization. OK, thank you very much, Mohammed. Um, time is running a little bit against us for the q and I'm just uh, wondering if we have a time for one more. Um, Let's, uh, I don't know, maybe we should think about wrapping this up. I can't see any more questions coming through. Yeah, Tom, um, Tom Craft has asked one. Ken, Tom Craft has uh, asked one about digital power. All right, okay. Yes, yes, here it is. You keep mentioning digital power. What is digital power? I know of digital electricity. Is this the same technology and solution based on it? Paul? Yeah. Um, it's a brand, it's, I'll, I'll call it a brand, it's the name of the department, Tom, that we've called Digital Power. And very specifically, when we talk about things uh, digital and consumer, it's really taking information about consumer behaviour and then providing a, a value-added benefit to it, usually experience, yeah. yes. If we look at the word digital in something like in an enterprise, then it's analysing that enterprise, that business, and then uh, improving the business outcome yeah so in digital power and, and both of those require ai so what we've done in the digital power unit is instead of having a basic photovoltaic cell or a conventional rectifier or conventional batteries what we've done is we've applied ai components all right so we've provided those in a i'll call it a closed loop between all three of those in that subsystem so the idea the concepts are that we can observe the behavior of any system requiring energy and then we can optimize how that energy is supplied from the grid from uh, from renewables or from the batteries yes and we can tweak the performance of the rectifier and other things accordingly okay so yeah. we can do that pretty much on demand and that's why we've called it digital power because of that uh, rather unique part of ai that we've applied into something that was generally a fairly basic technology yeah, Thanks yeah, so and the precisely just uh, uh, complementing what you just mentioned, Paul, that's absolutely true. So basically, in the past, uh, power electronics and ICT were like silos. So basically, what we did, we basically make the, uh, the concept is making bits manage the what. So what? we are combining our capability from the ICT, making that very... Uh, useful in reducing the watts uh, for our, uh, not only for the footprint of our equipment or the industry, telecom industry, but also as a handprint for other industry. So just remember this, bits manage what? More bits, less what? On, on that note, Mohammed, more bits, less what? <laughs> we're going um, we're gonna to wrap up the Q&A. So, so thank you very much. Uh, for the, it was a fantastic Q&A, and thank you all for um, participating. So now we're going to move on swiftly to our virtual fireside chat between Andy Purdy and John Arnold. As I mentioned in the introduction, John is principal of J. Arnold & Associates and is an experienced and highly respected independent analyst and consultant. Under the broad theme of innovating for resilience, John and Andy will be talking about technology megatrends and how such things as automation, IoT, hyper-connectivity, robotic process automation, and AI will shape the future. Um, other topics of conversation, I believe, are global supply chain resiliency, standardization, cyber secu security, and collaborative R&D models. So, John, Andy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Can uh, can we be seen okay? I think so. 
I guess we're just waiting. Uh, is Andy on screen yet? I hope so. There you are. Great. Okay, Andy, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, good. And I presume the audience can hear us just fine. So uh, terrific. Uh, very uh, interesting set of conversations going on, Andy, over the last uh, hour here. And uh, clearly there's a lot to talk about and for people both inside, uh, well, really mostly across the world, but, you know, to understand what the Huawei story is and also these bigger picture issues. So for our conversation, Andy, I, I'm going to kind of start at a very high level with some things that will touch on many of the themes that we've been talking about uh, earlier. So with those big picture topics that have just been covered, um, I like to start with this kind of also high level idea about fourth industrial revolution that keeps coming up in, in a lot of these analyses. So for me, when I think of that term, fourth industrial revolution, uh, big trends come to mind, such as automation, IoT, hyperconnectivity, robotic process automation, and AI. So these technologies, as we know, are coming of age in a big way now. And they open up new possibilities across every sector of the economy. That said, though, Andy, lots of technologies, new technologies, fail as well. So I want to kind of start our chat off with the idea about this new next wave of industrialization, why it's so important with all these new technologies, and also what are the drivers going to be for us to have success with these new technologies as opposed to them stalling or even just failing outright? Well, I think uh, some of this has been has been touched on, but uh, I think we're thinking about the intelligent world uh, that will bring tremendous benefits to individuals and organizations. Uh, at a high level, uh, intelligent world means all things sensing. Uh, it means all things connected, uh, intelligent sensing data uh, to help power machine intelligence and hopefully help uh, inform machine intelligence a lot more than than current AI is, uh, and all things intelligent, big data, uh, artificial intelligence applications. Uh, we talked some about uh, the, the benefits of, 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 of power, of, of what can be done to green energy. But at, at, at a high level, I think you talk about potential success when you realize that the collaboration that's essential, we talked about the collaboration to identify, test, and move forward uh, with innovation, finding the business cases, find the use cases, uh, requires tremendous collaboration of, of potential uh, selling provider companies like Huawei, collaboration with industry partners, customers, to identify what the needs are in the context of particular countries uh, in which they do business. Uh, and uh, the pot potential regulatory construct, uh, the business cases and, and use cases. Uh, that kind of collaboration and testing helps identify uh, what is most likely to be successful? What's there the greatest need for? That that close collaboration with partners uh, really helps uh, figure out where is the need, what will people use and organizations do to pay for it. But the collaboration is really about stronger ecosystems, and we touched on some of that, uh, the, the joint innovation uh, that, that's so important. So that's one of the reasons Huawei has like 31 joint innovation centers around the world. We've got 16 R&D centers. We've got 45 training uh, centers. And so this work in collaboration helps shape the industry and it helps determine shape success because if, if our partners don't make money, uh, we're not gonna make money. And then of course, uh, what is going to happen inevitably, particularly as we uh, roll out the 5G enabled technologies, we move toward 5.5G uh, and so forth, Individuals and organizations are going to become more dependent on these technologies for their very way of life and their very health. And so that's when we get to the discussion about uh, the dependence that's going to exist, the importance of addressing the risks, the importance of promoting resilience in a way that's demonstrable. 
and way that there are abilities to have audits and independent independent conformance and testing programs to make sure that whoever the provider or supplier is or the operator are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Okay, so that's touching on some of the things I do want to, I'm going to get to in a few other questions, uh, Andy, but this is all really relevant stuff for uh, the audience to understand. But I want, I want to um, also just talk a little bit more about what this idea of fourth industrial revolution means, because we're moving to a world that requires more and more automation. And we're also living in a world that's driven by, in many ways, service economies, right? So there's automation needed for production of goods, right? But there's also automation needed for you know, supporting and enabling services. And these are two strands of the economy, right, that are very prominent now, whereas we were living primarily in a manufacturing economy until recent times. But I, I, I just find it interesting that this fourth generation here is really a broader story than just what goes on in factories, right? I mean, information takes many forms of value now, and it doesn't have to factor into just being a physical product. Right, and, and so some of the items that were touched on before, but um, the, the technology helping to bring computing power to the edge with speed, with, with the, the reduced latency, latency, with the ability to have multiple connections at a particular place, and then the ability to have sensor to machine, machine to communication, uh, automation, <clears throat> robotics, using big data analytics enabled by the cloud, they can have the computing power right there. Uh, these things are going to help bring benefits in different industry sectors uh, to help, uh, for example, in, in smart farming, to help make sure that the, the nutrition in the soil is right, to make sure there's, there's adequate water, to make sure that, that bugs or, or other infestations are, aren't affecting them. Uh, uh, the, one of the things that, that we've done, which I think is a very exciting thing, and it, it kind of reminds me of this book, uh, uh, The Innovator's Dilemma, about major companies that do big things have difficulty moving into more advanced new kinds of technologies because they want to hold on uh, to the revenue generation uh, ways that they made money before. And so in a way we've been helped by forcing us to revisit our product portfolio, to revisit what the opportunities are, what the path forward means in terms of technology and our commitment to particularly the R&D, which at over 22% of, of uh, revenues is, is invested in R&D, is just absolutely astounding. It would be impossible uh, for a, a publicly traded company. But the investment in R&D and the investment in talent, the tens of thousands of young students, of, of smart experts that, that we hired last year and we hired every year, the, the commitment to talent and the commitment that was reinforced this week that Huawei is going to continue uh, as a as a uh, employee-owned company is going to continue to make sure that employees uh, are incentivized uh, to to work hard and, and to produce results. And uh, some are paid to just do pure research. And it's, uh, it's very, very exciting. You mentioned manufacturing. Well, manufacturing is, is, is critically important in terms of increasing the efficiency, reducing the power consumption, uh, and reducing the cost of creating new things is, is fundamentally important. And we see that across industry. I think Paul mentioned, for example, healthcare, the 5G enabled technology helps the treat identification, treatment and monitoring of patients uh, that can be remote. And this helps bring these benefits to people throughout individual countries. The ability to have these kinds of technologies in remote hospitals, the ability to have them in ambulances so they come so the doctors can analyze the patients. We see these kinds of things in industry after industry. And what, what's really been exciting, some of the numbers that we, we released, uh, I guess it was earlier this year, that in our digitalization, in our 5G to be, bringing 5G uh, to business, uh, working with our carriers and partners, we signed more than 3,000 commercial contracts for industrial 5G applications. So. Industry, typical industry scenarios like remote equipment control, data collection, product quality inspection, uh, manufacturing, mining, steel ports. And in fact, we've done some things that I think are very exciting that 
I'm not sure we're touched on entirely in the book, The Innovator's Dilemma, but the idea of creating specified teams in particular business areas that are supported by the global company, but they can strike down barriers in horizontal, verti uh, horizontal vertical integration, horizontal and vertical integration uh, that can help prioritize what needs to be done and bring value to the end users. Uh, we also have in our working with uh, over 30,000 partners, we've identified 500 scenario-based 5G to business solutions. Uh, we've deployed with our partners more than 10,000 in the enterprise market. Applications like intelligent iron and steel, intelligent coal mining, intelligent ports, cement, manufacturing, chemicals, intelligent oil and gas. And you look at an area where we form some of the focus teams such as roads and ports and, and, and mining. Take mining, for example. The ability to have folks remotely working from outside the mines to have the safety of, of being outside those capabilities, the, the work that has to be done there. New innovations that Huawei has done, led, led by this team, to deploy 5G underground and to make sure that the energy that's necessary to, to sustain that 5G is a much lower typical energy because you want to avoid any kinds of explosions that could happen in the mine. So the specialization that can come from these, these individual teams to find business opportunities, to find solutions. Uh, and so that really helps with our overall strategy of strengthening innovation, helping industries and government, frankly, go digital and helping build a low carbon world. These are the kinds of things that are, that are going to benefit everyone. These are the kinds of things that, that make that will make Huawei incre increasingly competitive and it's going to allow us to survive through these very, very difficult times. And, and frankly, I'm very excited this week to hear more about our investment in these foundational technologies, uh, including in digital technologies, in developing clean power, enabling energy digitalization, bringing information technology together uh, with energy digitalization is, is very, very exciting. Yeah, for sure. The, these are really uh, important for you know frontiers, right? That are benefiting from these new technologies. And um, a theme that we talk about quite regularly is is the need for collaboration, right? Because I, I mentioned you know with this this coming back to this fourth industrial revolution, what makes it different from previous generations and iterations is that it these become global issues now right that technology in particular is borderless so anybody could be doing anything so you could be innovating in 10 different parts of the world all coming up with basically similar solutions but not being coordinated so the technology benefits are are very promising but there's also still a bit of a wild west element to this right that it could you know you could be duplicating a lot of effort unnecessarily and you know we, we could be getting results faster and probably at lower cost to get those benefits. So I want to just kind of explore this collaboration kind of topic a little bit with you, Andy. Because and we've covered some of this before, but I, I want to look at four different things. Some of these you've touched on already, but um, the, the first part. I mean, if we're going to be collaborating on a global basis across economies, across political systems, across geographies, etc. Um, you know, we're living it now. The, so global supply chain, we know it's, a, it's, it's challenging right now. What do we need to do to make that supply chain resilient, to kind of address these issues of borderless technologies, to get that collective benefit? Well, I think that's the, the combination, and, and I mentioned it uh, uh, at a high level earlier, uh, the need to have a comprehensive approach that's recognized globally. Uh, mm -hmm. to uh, assessing risk, managing risk, and promoting resilience. And that collaboration is necessary to help bring forward the zero trust principles, the, the, the zero trust ideas that was mentioned in President Biden's executive order on cybersecurity uh, last year. It's been a, <clears throat> been a real focus uh, even before that, but the emphasis in, in the United States government and, and governments in Europe and, and around the world to try to move forward with zero trust. And so the collaborations at the global level in terms of like 5G standards, the standards for telecom equipment, uh, the NISIS, the Network Equipment Security Assurance Scheme, uh, the need to identify, and, and you see it very actively in the European Union, for example, 
collaboration to understand what the risk is, how it can be addressed. I think we need more collaboration. We need more research and development on how do we promote greater transparency? How can we earlier detect, hopefully through stronger audit and certification mechanisms, whether companies or other organizations are doing what they need to do to address the risk? You know, the, 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 the idea that you learned that there was a problem because there's a major data breach or there's a major cyber attack, um, like the solar winds or Microsoft Exchange server attacks exactly. within the last year and a half, it's like, wait a second, th these old notions that gave us some comfort of, of trusted suppliers don't work for anybody. You know, the bad guys can hack into everybody. And so we as a global community, uh, we need to focus on that in terms of, okay, well, how do we move forward to identify in the shared responsibility, who needs to do what, what is it they need to do? And hopefully we have continuous feedback mechanisms so those can continue to improve. Which things need to be incorporated in contractual provisions for supply chain or operational uh, environments? Which need to be incorporated into the controls that might be mandated as part of standards? Which of these kinds of things need to be considered by government? Hopefully not as much regulation, at least not prescriptive regulation, but in terms of things like what ought to be disclosed to government so there's a better idea of of whether something concerning is happening, there's a better ability of the government, hopefully in close cooperation with the private sector, connecting the dots on who's doing what that's bad, how can we identify them, and, and how can we reduce the risk? So the, the need, for, need for collaboration, it, it cuts across the, the innovation, and the innovation has to include the other part of collaboration, the risk uh, and the promoting resilience. Yeah, yeah, you you know you're right. I, I and I totally agree that you know this this need for standards. It's it's interesting that some sectors like the electrical world have agreed on global standards, right? And, and it makes the world a much safer and better place when it comes to just you know managing power. But we don't have that in other industries. And what do you think it would take for us to have better levels of this? For the, for the kind of things we're talking about here. This is all, it, it, it's quite difficult, it's complex, it's a moving target. The, these recent cyber attacks have motivated like the United States, for example, uh, Europe and others like, like they've never motivated before where they, they sold the ability of the bad guys to hack in and do bad things. And I, I think in some ways we, we've been lucky because things like the solar winds attacks, which I think were fundamentally about uh, national security intelligence gathering, uh, not intended to cause disruption, but those vulnerabilities that were exploited for that purpose could be exploited to, to launch very significant uh, di disruptive attacks. So the need for us to continue as a global community, continue to work together to figure out how do we in continually improve our ability to uh, understand the threat, to detect the threat, to set and modify requirements for companies and organizations to meet? How can we come up with ways to have greater transparency? How can we have better audit capabilities so we can tell when bad things are happening? And how can we promote greater accountability? That's one of the things we haven't had enough of in the United States. Uh, I think the work coming out of the executive order to try to raise the defenses of government, for example, hopefully the senior leaders of government are gonna be held accountable if they don't do what, what they should do. Hopefully the different sectors in the critical infrastructure sectors in the United States and elsewhere, the information will inform the companies in all those sectors and will inform companies that might be the kind that would that would do audits. Hopefully it can help inform the creation of independent testing labs. The example of common criteria that, you know, we've got hundreds of products certified by common criteria. There are, I think, 70 plus uh, internationally recognized labs around the world. We need to come up with greater recognized labs that are using uniform standards for testing. Uh, so there can be a consistency, a, a consistency, a hopefully a, a, a minimum best practice that can exist around the world and that can help inform contractual requirements. It can help inform government regulation or, or government disclosure requirements. And it can help inform the R&D roadmap as to how can we make things more transparent? How can we have a greater ability to detect how can we, consistent with the zero trust concept, recognize that the bad guys are going to get in? So we have to recognize that. So what, how can we improve our ability to cabin in or restrict the potential damage that's going to flow when the bad guys get in? And so that we can make sure we maintain the resilience, that the, the, the systems and networks will continue to be up and running. I also think internationally, we need to come up with some mechanisms that we don't have to strengthen the 
the, the global cyber norms are called under the United Nations Group of Governmental Experts, we need to improve the scope of those requirements. And we need to include much greater private sector involvement in those requirements. And we need to find out ways, and I think mutual trust agreements could be one of them, uh, where governments sign mutual trust agreements with other governments. They will not do bad things like use companies headquartered in their companies or the companies doing business in their countries to do bad things, to implant back doors or spy or, 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 you know, or, or steal data. And have companies sign mutual trust agreements, not only with their customers, but with the countries in which they do business. And let's have some decent punishment levels. Let's use a model like the European Privacy Directive that has punishment levels of up to 4% of global gross revenues for violations. If we care about these issues, and many people do, we need to raise the bar. We need to act toward these issues like we do when something really matters. And, and I think we're starting to see movement globally to do that, and that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and, you know, it's one thing to set good policy, right, but it's another thing to be able to enforce it. And uh, you're right, in the EU, I know, you know, they've levied some pretty big fines on, you know, some of the big tech players like Google. So there are mechanisms in place to kind of, as you said, you know, cabin in some of these things to mitigate bad behavior. But, but And it's also not just the bad guys, right? It's also the tech companies themselves that are, because there's so much data under their control, that there's, there's a lot of opportunity there for, for them well, to do think, things that they yeah, probably shouldn't. Yeah, we, and we certainly have some issues, particularly in the United States, but talking to some friends in other countries, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a difficulty talking about certain complicated issues with people that we disagree with. And... So uh, I was heartened to see the U.S. Trade Representative appointed by President Biden uh, at a Center for Strategic International Studies event uh, within the last year. Talk about, OK, um, just because we have huge, huge issues with China, meaning the U.S. government, it doesn't mean we shouldn't talk with them to find out if there are areas in which we can agree, uh, where we can find common ground, and we can try to put in some principles that could encourage or incentivize the countries to abide by those rules. The same thing is true in terms of what Huawei's doing in terms of the innovation space in the U.S. It, it really behooves the United States to, to, to talk with Huawei and, and, and other major innovating companies in the world about, about what the future looks like, what it should look like, what are the requirements, and to share information through peer-reviewed articles about the R&D and the progress. This is the way the world traditionally has benefited. Uh, and frankly, when you look at issues that, that Huawei's had with the United States, it's like, we want to talk with the United States government. You know, don't talk to the Chinese government about it. We have issues we want to talk about. We hope we'll have a chance to talk about it. And there doesn't necessarily have to be an agreement in the end, but it feels like it's kind of contrary to the traditional approach of, of the United States to not even be willing to talk about a company, to talk with a, co a particular company. We have things we've done and learned with companies countries around the world that, that we can share in terms of possible risk mitigation and and we would love to participate in those conversations and and frankly issues right now in the u.s there seems to be a lot of pushback on globalization tremendous benefits in the last 30 years from globalization we've got to make sure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. again similar to what i said the uh the uh, trade rep uh talked about is we need to look at things like globalization in terms of what's in the best interest of the united states it's not in our best interest to refuse to sell anything to China or refuse to buy anything from China. We need to look at it more dispassionately, more focused. And the same goes with cybersecurity risk. We need to be able to talk about these issues because being informed and understand each other better and trying to find ways we can collaborate is going to benefit everybody and help promote a safer cyberspace where people and organizations can get the full benefit of these very important technologies. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Politics aside, that's a, that is a whole other tangent to this thing. The the issues you're talking about, you know, are, are really important because you know scientific research, academic research has always been pretty borderless, right? I mean, it's it's a pursuit of knowledge, right? But when you know when you layer on the political, that's that changes the whole thing. But I just want to come back to what you talked about a bit earlier, Andy, about this idea of open approaches, open models to R and D, and clearly. Huawei is doing a ton of really good R&D work, way above what most companies normally do. And the fact that you talk about having 
to foster an open climate for that, for sharing. You know, if more and more countries, more and more companies were doing this, you say, okay, there's collective benefit to this. When you talk about, you know, the innovation, you know, who are the biggest patent holders globally now, right? It used to be the U.S. and Europe dominated that landscape now, but, you know, you have to look at where, you know, Korea, South Korea, sorry, China. I mean, these are the biggest patent holders in the world now. So you look where the knowledge resides and where the innovation is coming from. Um, you know, you've got to take a global approach to this, you know. You don't not there's no one country or company has a monopoly on all the good ideas. And we're well, all trying to solve the same the, problems. Fortunately, the, the scientific community on, on the whole does a pretty good job of of sharing information and using the concept of of peer reviewed articles, having the concept of information sharing at, at the technical conferences. Uh, those are really a good thing. And a, and a number of the issues that we we're talking about today in terms of the hardcore research that uh, Huawei experts in partnership with some other experts have, have been working on. Uh, uh, Glenn mentioned uh, Moore's Law and, and the, uh, the Shannon Limit as, as examples. We have to encourage that technical conversation and hopefully by sessions like this and, and others, if, if folks are willing to host them in the United States, we can bring together people, not necessarily at the, at the full technical level, but talking about what the requirements are and why, what the priorities ought to be, uh, what kinds of collaboration might be possible, what kinds of issues it might benefit everybody to have a joint innovation center on, on certain things. But without dialogue, we, we can't find those areas for, for potential agreement. Yeah. Um, okay. So what would you say, you know, if you could change one thing today, Andy, to be a kind of a tangible indication of progress. What, what do you think it would be? Well, I, it, it really goes to the, the broader problem of, of in our country right now, frankly, it would be a, a greater ability to talk about controversial issues uh, dispassionately and to try to use data uh, and what data is present or what data is missing uh, on policy questions, po major policy decision making, uh, because it, it's like people don't listen to the other side and they don't consider why does the other side believe things a certain way? What can we learn from the other side? And that 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 environment, that, that very difficult environment, so many people can't talk to family about important issues. They, they can't talk to neighbors about issues because people are so friggin' hostile. They're so committed to, to their point of view and, and they're just blind to any kind of discussion. I would like us to have a greater willing to talk with each other and particularly a greater willingness to listen. Well, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you on that one. And, it's, you know, th this is a good example of that. And I can think of a lot of others, too, where, you know, that kind of listening and taking an open up view of things goes a long way to understanding. Because I, I agree with you about that is you can't understand the other side until you talk to them. And engage. Yeah. So I'd also like to think about, you know, the bigger problems we're trying to wrestle with that go beyond all of this stuff. You know, we start talking about, you know, clean energy, climate change, sustainability, um, uh, you know, and, and even even food supply. I mean, these things, you know, are overarching needs that we all have to work on, and the disparities we have globally show that there's a, a lot of work to be done. So it, it seems to me, if I was thinking about one positive uh, that could change minds on this, would be to have more examples of cooperation wherever you can get it. And so I'm just saying, you know, the, the, the bigger the pie becomes of countries and companies who are talking on the same level about the same things, working to the same ends, that grows and, and you know, in terms of, providing legitimacy and, and validity to that position. And the more you stay outside of that, the more isolated you become. And that's, that's you know, it doesn't help things. But, I, you know, I know this can get bogged down in a lot of that, the geopolitics. Um, it's clear that, you know, Huawei is, is, has got a really far-reaching uh, plan for the future in terms of, you know, this intelligent world that we're talking about here uh, and all the, the, the earlier speakers. 
Um, there's a lot of opportunity there, and, and but yet we still don't know a lot about how these things are going to unfold. And I guess that's what makes this an interesting time, right? I mean, we see the potential of these technologies, but we still have a long way to go to realize them. Um, what I, I just want to get a little bit more flavor from you on this idea about these new frontiers when we, you know, we're all still getting excited about 5G, but, but Huawei's already on to 6G and talking about 10 gig service, you know, things that we just don't even have on the roadmap right now. Um, how far ahead do you think companies need to be thinking? Are they doing enough of this or is Huawei kind of the exception that way? Well, it's hard to tell. Um, I, you know, I'm not a, a technical expert. Um, I'm certainly heartened by the information that, that Huawei shared. Certainly, uh, things like some of the uh, the global uh, climate goals for 2030, for example, uh, are, are very encouraging. And the work that uh, that Huawei is doing, I, I think climate change may be one where this is an area that there ought to be, you know, the U.S. ought to be willing to talk with Huawei about uh, about what we're doing. I mean, our research on on solar photovoltaic uh, systems, uh, the uh, effort to uh, bring together uh, integrating artificial intelligence in cloud, uh, bringing together digital information technology with energy, uh, the idea of, of optimizing power generation, the ability to store and transmit it, uh, making the solar power plant highly efficient, safe and reliable. Uh, the these things can help make solar a primary energy source. And so by doing these activities, we've already helped uh, millions of residents and hundreds of industries globally uh, move toward carbon neutral. And, and I think that's very exciting and very important. So hopefully it's something we can talk about. Well, we certainly have you know, global bodies that are trying to fix some of these problems, right? But e even then, it's, it just shows you how difficult it is to get agreement on, you know, the climate accords and reducing carbon footprint, et cetera. But I think you have to go beyond that and just say, no, these are the right things to be doing because clearly we have these issues. Right. That's a question of, in some ways, a question of, okay, in addition to limiting fossil fuels, what can we do to move forward to increase efficiency, to help with risk mitigation? And, and some of these hardcore questions like, what can we do, and we're trying to work hard on it, to figure out how can we better inform uh, the use of artificial intelligence, studying better how machines perceive the world, and the possibility of building models to teach machines how to understand the world. How do we understand the, the physiological mechanisms of the human body, including how the eight systems of the body work as human intent and intelligence, help to create new sensing and control capabilities, New, you know, real-time unobtrusive blood pressure, blood sugar, heart monitoring, AI-assisted discoveries in chemical pharmaceuticals, uh, more efficient application-centric automated intelligence software, um, overcoming some of these pure technological limits, such as uh, in Shannon's limit and, and Moore's law, trying to come up with more adaptive and efficient computing modules, models. All these things are going to help. And so when you talk about a potential you know, dear or uh, date or future, it's like, we got to work on these hard problems, even though some of them aren't going to bear out. We've got to work on inventing new molecules, catalysts and components with intelligence commuting, computing. Um, all these things can help move us toward the future. And as we can learn new things, that can help us identify new issues that we're going to want to attack, uh, hopefully collaboratively in the longer term. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, you know, it, it sometimes, as you, you know, as you've indicated before, it takes in this in take in this case of cybersecurity, it takes a big breach, right? A big problem that forces you to focus on the issue, and we've just kind of come out of this, haven't we, with COVID, right? That pandemic is is a very different thing than an endemic, and it's really forced everybody to work globally to find a solution, and all things considered. You know, the speed with which vaccines have been developed to get COVID under control have been pretty impressive. And it, it shows you, I think, what's possible when we can work together and have that common goal, right? And you think, you know, why does it have to be so hard for all these other things? 
right? Why do we have to just only be responding to these disasters? Right, that's right. Okay. Well, okay, I think we are kind of on our, on time here. Uh, if I can maybe bring Ken back into the fold. Uh, I, I know you're kind of the master of ceremonies here. Have we got Ken? Yes, I'm here. I am, John. Yes. Okay. Thank you, John and Andy. That, that was great. I mean, as we've heard from Hawaii, we've seen executives in the discussion segment, the Q&A session, and the virtual fireside chat between Andy and John, we've heard that Hawaii is a strong supporter of industry collaboration on cybersecurity and R&D. And Andy Purdy pointedly notes Hawaii is keen to engage with the US government on risk mitigation and share the latest technologies and innovations for the benefit of all. Moreover, we've heard that through diversification into different parts of the supply chain, US-led sanctions have not slowed down the pace of Huawei innovation. R&D levels are set to remain at impressively high percentage of sales, it seems. So thank you again for all the participants in the webinar. And just another reminder that Light Reading will send an on-demand link so you can watch a video replay. So thank you very much. Thank you, take care. Okay, thanks everybody. <laughs>